night may be long and the dark may be deep, but the answers are there to be found. Whether it's the normal, the abnormal, or the paranormal, you're in the right place. Let's go beyond reality. It's Tuesday on the West, Wednesday on the East. Many of you are stuck somewhere in between. Welcome to Beyond Reality Radio with me, Jason Hawes, and the always awesome J.V. Johnson. All right, so I'm working here on a cocktail of Fruity Pebbles. Oh, I thought you meant just like a cocktail, I like will, yeah. you know, rum runners and stuff. I mean, I'd be I'd be there working with you. Yeah, that would be a much easier cocktail to do with. this. I had three bowls of Fruity Pebbles before the show. Oh, I needed, that's, that's not good. Yeah, I don't know what I was thinking, but I was watching uh, The Curse of Oak Island tonight. I did, too. And I was a little bit hungry, so I just found myself, uh, you know, kind of captivated by what they were doing and refilling my Fruity Pebbles bowl over and over again until I realized I had too much of that yabba-dabba goodness. You know what I used to... It's funny. When I was younger, my, my mom, she'd buy a box of the Cocoa Pebbles. And yeah. I would... I, because you, you always feel, especially when you're younger and your metabolism works, um, you feel like, ah, oh, the bowls are too small. Yeah. So I would get usually one of her like refrigerator containers... Oh, and I would geez. just and I would pour it in and, and of course it had the best chocolate milk ever. Yeah, you know, after, after you let yeah. it sit there and yeah. and but man, I just I can't do it anymore. Well, you know they say those boxes are family size, but I, I, <laughs> those are those are yeah, <laughs> that's no, one those meal are person <laughs> size. Well, yeah, maybe maybe in other countries. I don't know the Americans, yeah, yeah, know. you know, size idea. Yeah, we have a is much totally grander. different. I mean, yeah, it's like you want to supersize it. Of course I do. Yeah, Why wouldn't I? Right. I but anyways, welcome to Beyond Reality Radio, everybody. And uh, if you haven't yet, head over to facebook.com slash beyond reality radio. Like that Facebook page for us. Then head to beyondrealityradio.com where you can find all the stations we are on across the country. You can download the smartphone apps, which will also allow you to listen live and catch past shows and more. Or any night we're live, just click the listen live or the listen live and chat button right from the website. And listen to the show while browsing the web. If you download the show from iTunes or anywhere else, just take the two seconds for us and please rate it. It helps uh, push the show forward, makes it easier to find. Yeah, you know, and I love seeing the numbers uh, continually increase for the downloaded program. We, of course, love people to listen to live. We really do enjoy that. However, uh, the number of people that just can't do that because they work early in the morning, so they download the program the next day, those numbers are rising tremendously. And it's so good to see that audience building as well. Tens of thousands of people are downloading the show pretty much on a daily basis, and we greatly appreciate that. And the show's only a success because of you all, and we're only on all these stations because of you all, and we know that, and we greatly appreciate that, and uh, it's a big thank you from myself and JV to all of you. Yeah, and if you end up moving to South Carolina, you would say that we owe oh, a big thanks to y'all instead of y'all. y'all. That's what my wife heard. My <laughs> wife says that, because she was, she was from Virginia, North Carolina, and yeah. she's, yeah, and she's always... You know, you, you, her. I mean, she, she's a Southern girl. So tonight, uh, as I was engorging myself on Fruity Pebbles and watching The Curse of Oak Island, I was watching it with an eye toward tonight's guest, because tonight we're going to be chatting about this. Yeah, I, I, and it was, it was a pretty good show tonight. I'll give it that. Yeah, it was. I mean, you know, you know one thing is for certain. If they end up finding this treasure in this season... Uh, they won't do it until the last episode. So we, we, no, we know that's not going to happen. Draw, they'll draw yeah. it out. They'll be like, oh, my God, we found... Yeah, right. Next yeah, season next on week, the yeah. cur- uh, next season on the Curse of Oak Island. Could you imagine if they found the treasure already and they've ha- they have to keep this under wraps and they're going to drag it out for two or three more seasons? Oh my gosh! Could you imagine that? No, I would lose my mind. Yeah, and there's and the tr- and there's I know on the show they talk a lot about uh, well the um, the Ark and all that stuff possibly being there. But there's a lot of different treasures that have been said to be buried there throughout the years. Everything from pirate treasures to, uh, well, like I said, the Holy Grail and the Ark of the Covenant, um, uh, Marie Antoinette's jewels, uh, British Imperial treasures, and the list goes on and on. So God only knows what they're going to find. The place has such history. And I think even Blackbeard, they were, there was talk about Blackbeard's treasure being buried there as well, correct? Uh, is that the guy from SpongeBob or is it some? Yeah, yeah. No, that's, yeah, that's is the that only like, Blackbeard I know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't pay any attention yeah, to no, there, there is Yeah, no, there is discussion. And the, the, the thing that makes this so fascinating is that there are so many theories, yet so few answers that can point to anything specifically. There are a lot of little clues all over the place, but nothing that can definitively say it was the, uh, the Knights Templar or it was a pirate or it was some somebody else or you know they, they can't connect it to any source yet so even if there's nothing there something happened there at some point oh absolutely and the lagina brothers honestly it, it's funny because i look at them like 
they're just they're big kids on a treasure hunt. And which is exactly how you and I would be, JB. Yeah, we're both the kind of guys we we love the metal detectors and getting out there and and looking around and so forth. And to have an island to ourselves to do it, my gosh, I know it, it would know. be like heaven sent for Can us. Can you imagine Ghost Island if we we could go hang out on an island that's known as Ghost Island? That and would just, be epic. Yeah, wouldn't but it? just metal detectors. I mean, oh yeah, well, I, lo- I love to walk around like that. I love to walk around metal detectors and just and check things out. I, my boys do it. It's so fun it is. because it you is. never know what you're going to find and my kids will dig up uh an old pepsi can and they'll be like mind blown oh my god i wonder who the last person and of course now they're they're older so they're <laughs> the not pepsi that excited can't. about a pepsi can <laughs> but the fact of the matter is when they'd be eight nine ten years old and they'd get a hit and they dig and they find a just an old bottle top or whatever mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it would be it would be like treasure to them it, it would, would truly treasure. be like yeah. like they just dug up a pirate's treasure yeah um the, uh, most of you know who alex is she does a lot of the call screening here with slick eddie um i got her she's my daughter and i got her in metal detector a few years back and because of the curse of oak island she's got rekindled a uh, an interest in it and has dusted the thing off and i think she's going to wait until the snow goes away but she's going to get out there and start doing some metal detecting yeah because it would suck first you gotta shovel the, the snow and then you gotta yeah then you, you got to chisel the ground. You got to melt the ground before you can dig into it. So anyway, our, our culmination of this discussion is that tonight's guest, Randall Sullivan, is an author, and he's written a book called The Curse of Oak Island, which is basically a companion book to the TV show. He followed and worked with the Lagina brothers, did a lot of research on the island in its 200-plus year history of treasure hunting, and we're going to talk with him. We're not only we're going to talk about the island, its history, and its mystery, but we're going to talk about how the Lagina brothers are conducting their search and the different approaches they've been taking and whether or not he thinks they're ultimately going to be successful. Well, and then when it comes down to it, is what they find going to be worth what's been well, spent? That's or, it. And uh, honestly, is that really a concern? I mean, I know I know the Lagina brothers have uh, done very well for themselves in, in other areas as well, but, and, and you sit there and think, well, if you invest you know, ten million or fifteen million into this, yeah. and you find something that's worth five. Was it really worth it? Right. And I guess it really is because the fact of the matter is, it's such a piece of history. So I can see that I can see the worth on that. That that becomes priceless. But you just well, gotta it, wonder when enough is. You're like, ah, I've stuck, I've, I've stuck so much money into this. I don't know. I mean, you've got two things to th- consider here. One is that um, if it is just a standard treasure, if it is just Blackbeard's treasure, you know, and it's a it's a chest full of gold or whatever, uh, whatever that's worth is going to be, I think, about fifty percent of it's going to go to the uh, Canadian government um, yeah. as they pull it out of the ground, and then the rest is clearly not going to be worth the the amount of money, if not the Lagina brothers personally, but certainly all this all the efforts that have uh, been uh, undertaken over the course of two hundred years, they've obviously outspent that treasure. However. If it's some kind of amazing artifact, like a holy relic or something along those lines, where you can't really put a price well, on like it. the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, of yeah, well, exactly. But exactly. Yeah, I mean, then again, if the government gets half, what happens? Yeah, what to that? What they it's kind of. I'd love to see how does they do that. Does that mean, yeah, do they, do they have to open it at that I'm sorry, point? We to, get to God, separate it? We get God's attention on uh, half of the day, and you get it for the rest of the day. Uh, yeah, I don't so, know how that works. I don't know, but you know who they could have asked? They, they, they could ask the Grand Warlock of Mexico, saying he just made his 2019 predictions. Oh, uh, what? What does he predict? It, uh, especially coming from Mexico, I'm anxious to hear these. No, this uh, this is interesting. I mean, uh, let me see if I got this story right, because it's all broken up into pieces, so just bear with me. But, uh, all right, so one of his claims is the U.S. government shutdown that's dragged on for uh, two weeks will last longer, according to him. But um, his predictions are that, uh, well, he's known as the Grand Warlock, and these are his annual predictions of the year, uh, 2019. I guess he does this every year. But he says the U.S. president would not get funding for the wall in 2019 or ever. All right, so he was hovering tarot cards over his head and yelling into a microphone and everything else. Um, He also said uh, there will be very grave problems arising from this wall foolishness, that the wall will never be built. Um, He claims that... You sure this uh, guy isn't named Chuck Schumer? Um, (laughs) It's... (laughs) The or, warlock or, or Chuck Nancy. Schumer. Jeez, <laughs> uh, I mean, it sounds like things he's saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, and of course, it's coming on, uh, coming out the same day that Trump pretty much said he'll do whatever it takes to, uh, and 
keep the shutdown going for as long as he needs to uh, to get the five point six billion. But sometimes um, I really wish this was a political talk show because I have a yeah, lot to let's say. Leave it alone. I know we're not going to touch but, it, but sometimes I wish. But you know, he's kind of spotty with his track record, though, because in two two thousand sixteen, he predicted that Trump would lose a Republican primary election, and last year he predicted that Mex- Mexico's president uh, presidential election would be ru- uh, won by a ruling party candidate, Jose Ant- Antonio Meade. Who ended up finishing a distant third? So, I don't know. It depends on how much. Yeah. So really... his track record is kind of questionable, I guess. Yeah. So, but he's, I don't know. he's got we'll a cool see. name, and he's probably the only warlock in Mexico. So and he's got a big, long white beard and a big, so long white beard. He's too. amazing. Yeah, it's just an amazing look. Yeah. So no matter good. what, you got to respect the guy. <laughs> I, I respect him all over the place. Yeah. So he's like the the Mexican version of Santa Claus. Oh. Uh, okay. I'll take that. Hey gang, JV here. You know that great nutrition can lead to a great life. Healthy, happy, rewarding. But that nutrition simply cannot be found in the foods we eat alone. Take a minute and assess your health. The way you feel. The way your family feels. The way your kids feel. Health is more than just feeling well. It's also making sure you have a strong immune system. Especially in these trying times. Vitamins aren't enough alone. In fact, they have to be the right vitamins. The right supplements made from the most effective ingredients. Otherwise, they don't do the job. It makes the world of a difference. There's a new website you can visit that'll help you navigate these ideas and guide you to better health. There's no obligation. Just visit myhealthrocksnow.com. That's myhealthrocksnow.com and start feeling better today. Welcome back to Beyond Reality Radio, Jason and JV. Uh, Our phone number is 844-687-7669. We're going to open up the phone lines for your questions and comments in our second hour of the program. But tonight we're honored and privileged to have a guest on the program who uh, actually is going to be talking and has written about something that Jason and I seem to spend a lot of time talking about. And of course, I mean the Oak Island mystery. Randall Sullivan is a writer. He has written a book called The Curse of Oak Island, which um, basically chronicles the 200 plus year history of treasure hunting, which is currently uh, being managed by the Lagina Brothers. And it's actually being presented to us on the History Channel uh, on a television show called The Curse of Oak Island. Randall, welcome to Beyond Reality Radio. I, to say we're excited about this is an understatement. Well, thanks for having me. And we've been looking forward to this. So, I, you know, this is a short segment before we have to go to our next break, but I'm going to ask this question right away just to get it out of the way. Is there anything on Oak Island? I don't know what there is on Oak Island. What I know is that there is the remains of something extraordinary that people did on Oak Island sometime more than 200 years ago. And the mystery of what that is and why they did it is what makes it such a compelling place and a compelling story. You know, there's a uh, there's there's these things in our lives that are kind of uh, milestones or markers in your life, and the JFK assassination is a good, was is a good example of that because people always say when they if they were alive during that uh, assassination, they know where they were at that moment when they heard about it. I have to say, one of those things for me is the day I learned about the mystery at Oak Island. And it was something that was presented by our science teacher in a science class in, in school. And um, I guess the same question to you. Where were you that uh, when you learned about this unbelievable mystery, and how did you get the bug for it? Well, I was working for Rolling Stone magazine at the time, and I just was talking to one of the editors about exploring some of history's mysteries and started to do a little research. I had no idea that Oak Island even existed, um, found a reference to it, a very limited reference to it in a, a book, and, and then got interested and convinced Rolling Stone to send me there and let me write an article. Well, and there's so much history, and well, there's so many different claims of things that are possibly on Oak Island, whether it's pirate treasure, uh, Spanish naval treasure, uh, right down to Marie Antoinette's jewels and British imperial treasure and so forth. And, there, and there's such a possibility because each episode, especially recently, we've been able to see them finding different coins and, and an old cross and, and things that are actually dating back to that time and some even prior to when these treasures were supposed to have been buried there. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, that's part of what makes Rolling Stone so, or, or excuse me, what makes uh, the Oak Island so compelling is that uh, uh, it's like a Rorschach test. You can, you can see 
so much in it because there is obviously a lot there. Something incredible happened. People must have had a fantastic reason for doing these, this fantastic work. And there's tantalizing tidbits that have been found for oh, more than 200 years now, but they don't add up to a single conclusion. Yeah, Randall, um, you... you... I don't know. If, I don't know if I missed it. You were talking about uh, being introduced to the mystery, the history of Oak Island, when you were writing for Rolling Stone magazine. When was that? That was two thousand and three. The first time I went to Oak Island was uh, September of two thousand and three. At that time, Oak Island was basically a for- forbidden place, off limits. The people who controlled it weren't hadn't let anyone on it in years. So just talking my way out to the island was, wow. the, was the biggest part of the job. W- w- was it owned privately at that point? It was. actually. Yeah, two, two men controlled it, and only one of them actually lived on the island. His name was Dan Blankenship. He and his wife were the only two people on the island then, that, which was part of what made it such a spooky place. But uh, so, And Dan, had the, the causeway was chained, and he wasn't letting anybody across and hadn't let anybody across wow. in years. Now, it was d- a very... Yeah, I was going to say Dan was one of the treasure hunters. He's one of, the, and he's on the program. Yeah, he's one of the most legendary. He's, you know, he's the most legendary living uh, treasure hunter. And was Nolan? Island. Was Nolan the other one by any chance? The other owner? Fred, Fred Nolan owned some property on Oak Island. Also, it was a much smaller piece, and he could didn't have access to the causeway, so which he couldn't <laughs> drive on the island. He wow. had to get there by boat, and he was much more even more difficult, actually, than Dan to, to yeah. uh, get access to, although he did speak to me, with me because he was curious about what Dan had said. They were bitter rivals at the time. Yeah, it seems to have played out that way, and then there may have been a bit of a um, uh, a reconciliation toward the end of uh, Nolan's life. All right, listen, we have to take a break right now, but I'm already intrigued and anxious to ask more questions. Oh, yeah, there's a lot more to come. All right, and we're going to take a quick break. A lot more to come. You listen to Jason JV, Beyond Reality Radio. We'll be back after this. Please support the program. Go to patreon.com slash Joha. That's J-O-H-A-W. The mystery of Oak Island is our discussion tonight. Our guest is Randall Sullivan. He is a writer, and he's written a book called The Curse of Oak Island, and we're very pleased to have him on the program. And, Randall, before the break, we were talking about how the island had been closed off uh, to the public, basically, for a number of years. One of its owners, who is anybody who watches the program on the History Channel knows the name Dan Blankenship, um, controlled most of the island, controlled the causeway, wouldn't let anybody on. But you made your way on there. Uh, Were you one of the first to be able to gain access before it uh, became open to the public again? One of the first in a while. Uh, what the, the dispute between Dan Blankenship and Fred Nolan, who owned a smaller piece of the island, had created so much tension uh, and conflict I mean, to the point that actually the Mounties had to come and take a gun away from Dan at one Ooh, point. Uh, that, uh, that Dan had just decided he wasn't letting anybody on, and and he was shutting the whole thing down. Uh, and he controlled the access. There's only one way to drive onto the island, a causeway that was built back in the 60s. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, it, the, the biggest part of the job was get, getting him on the phone and convincing him to meet me for a drink and at least let me present myself. And, yeah, and, uh, you know, that led to an invitation to come over and uh, visit him on the island. And eventually I spent three or four days with him on the island. Wow. Was he still looking for the treasure at that point or had he resigned himself uh, to retirement at, at that stage? No. No, he, I mean, he was. He still was passionate about it and believed he he was close, but he was very frustrated. He, you know, he didn't have the resources. He had a financial backer, and he was in dispute with him as well, um, and felt that you know he wasn't getting the money to do what he needed to do. So he, he was frustrated, but he was still very passionate about it and utterly convinced that he wasn't that far from 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 finding his way to to whatever the secret of Oak Island is. And uh, uh, so, he, you know, and once you got him talking about it, I mean, he was, you know, filled with passion and feeling about it. Well, and now it was Blankenship and David Tobias, right, that owned Oak Island Tours? Yeah, yeah. David Tobias was basically the financial backer, a very wealthy Montreal businessman who was fascinated by the story he you know, visited years ago. And uh, so he, Dan was actually there on the island running the work, but uh, Tobias was putting up the money mostly. 
And that's how the Ligina brothers got involved, were by purchasing David Tobias's uh, 50% of the Oak Island Tours, correct? That, that, that's correct. So Blankenship closed the island off, uh, still doing some uh, work to attempt to solve the mystery. Was his effort to close it off more to keep other treasure hunters out of the area, or was did he just want to be left alone? I'm, yeah, a, a little of both. I mean, he, you know, he felt he was constantly being bothered by people who had this or that idea or wanted to, you know, sneak onto the island and try something. Uh, uh, you know, he was frustrated. He was just, he was very frustrated with people who had made it difficult for him. Um, uh, and I, I do think that he, at that very moment, there was a, a measure of resignation that, but, but at the same time, he was telling me, you know, and he was in his, I think I think he was in his 80s then. He was he was he was right around 80 then, and he was telling me that he he you know, wanted to get there before he died. That was you know he he knew and he knew he didn't have that much time, and so he was feeling increasing urgency with the passing of time. And do you think that that's why he's got such a close connection with the Lagina brothers that they're actually an extension of his work, and they're going to be able to try to figure this out while he while he's still with us? Yeah, well, I mean, they have tremendous respect for Dan. Although, I mean, the Laginas, you know, they also respected Fred. They go, they go wherever the information is, or wherever anyone has, you know, even a plausible theory, sometimes an implausible theory. Um, but so, I mean, they're they love Dan and, and revere him, really. Uh, but but they aren't exactly following in his footsteps. I mean, they are. I mean, they're, they're certainly building on what he's done, but. Well, but they're you, going a lot of different directions, and you can definitely see their their utmost respect for him when they do certain uh, certain things, and they go and they bring him down to to show him exactly what's going on. And I think that that's a very important part because he was such an uh, an important role in everything that's been going on in that island, and to still keep him involved that to that point, I think is just well, it's it's a sure sign of respect, and it's definitely a, just the right thing to do. Yeah, well, I mean, Dan Blankenship was an absolute lion of a man. I mean, this was a, a physical specimen who was extraordinarily brave physically and did things that few of us would be willing to do, like you know, go down this very narrow hole in a uh, you know with a diving tank and and uh, into you know very dangerous uh, situations and was nearly killed many times. So I mean, he's this is a driven man. Uh, you know, who's got a powerful press? Even in his in his nineties, he's got a powerful press. Now he um, was doing much of his heavy lifting, if you will, in the seventies. This was he was. You, there's images of him on the program all the time. Uh, you know, riding, uh, pushing dirt around with a bulldozer, and uh, you know, going down into the hole known as Ten X. Those types of things. When you met him, were a lot of was a lot of that kind of work being done, or was it more of an academic exercise by Dan at that point? It really was more academic for Dan by then. I mean, he still controlled the island. He took me to see 10X and took me to see the Money Pit and um, area. I mean, you can't actually see the Money Pit anymore. But but he, we did. I did go to the edge of 10X, and he invited me to, to descend a, a little ways if I wanted to. I, I took. <laughs> it was a very cold day, and you know, I looked down into that dark pit, and it was wet and slippery, and thought, I'll just stand on the edge here. <laughs> Yeah, I think I would have made the same choice. Um, so you you were able to visit with Dan, uh, and this was pre uh, in, uh, the Lagina Brothers. This was before they got involved. You went back. You wrote. Did you write an article about it for Rolling Stone? Is that what the next step was for you? Yeah, I, I wrote an article that was titled "The Curse of Oak Island," which you know I say is where the title came from. But <laughs> be that as it may, um, uh, and. Uh, and you know, I know the Laginas read it, and, and the producers of the show read it, and I think it had a lot to do with, you know, their excitement. Although M- Marty and Rick knew about Oak Island long before I wrote that article, and were, you know, their fascination preceded me by decades. But yeah, um, so yeah. yeah, I think they um, they tell the story of uh, I think it was uh, Rick having read a Reader Just Digest. Uh, article about the island back in the 60s and i think it was the same one i read but i read it as a as a mimeographed reproduction in, in school i think in the early 80s or late 70s um but i think it was the same article uh, but that that that's the stuff of of uh, boyhood fascination isn't it treasure hunting you know lost treasure mysteries puzzles and 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 um adventure 
Yeah, I mean, one of the most incredible things about this whole story is just that uh, Rick Lee, in particular, could sustain that fascination because he was, I think he was 14, 12 or 14, uh, when he read that article, and uh, 14. And the passion held, endured for the rest of his life until he was finally able to get on the island and get this, and, you know, carry the search forward. So he waited more than 40 years for his chance. And you know, was studying Oak Island from afar the whole time. So, I mean, this is truly a passion for him, and it's become one, I think, for Marty. Now, the book uh, that you've written, The Curse of Oak Island, uh, chronicles the over 200-year history of of searching for whatever it is that is or isn't there. Um, Can you walk us through the basics of that timeline? I can. I mean, the, the early... Story. There are some contradictions. I, I mean, I spent a lot of time while well, I was preparing to write the book, going back into the history and the genealogy, and just trying to confirm the the, the, the core story. And I found it really held up under close inspection. And it was it involved three young men, three teenagers, um, who who yeah, and and what exa- how what exactly it was that led them to this circular depression on the island. I mean, it could have been that there were they saw old oak trees that had been cut down, or there were unusual plants, or the depression was in a perfect circle, or there was a tackle block on the tree, on, on an old tree that was hanging over it. Whatever it was, they became convinced that there was a pirate treasure, actually the Captain Kidd treasure, because that was the legend that it was buried in that area. And uh, so they started digging, uh, and they got just... A, like 18 inches down and found this patio of flagstones that had clearly been very carefully laid. And, you know, that that obviously fired them. And so they, they kept digging and they dug down to 10 feet where they hit wood and thought they'd hit a treasure chest. But it turned out it was a platform of logs that were embedded in the sides of this perfectly circular hole because it was they could dig in this loose, soft dirt even though it was hard clay all around it, but there was a perfect circle of loose dirt where someone had clearly dug before. So they got, they tore those out, dug another 10 feet, hit, hit wood again, and thought, this time we really hit it. But it turned out to be another platform of logs. At that point, they looked up and saw 20 feet of, you know, clay hanging over them and knew that they could be buried alive easily. So they backed off, and uh, it took years before they found somebody who would mount a an expedition that, and it really was an expedition. They they hired a sloop and a big crew of men and sailed like 200 miles to get to the island, and uh, and they went and they descended into that hole, you know, by building wooden cribbing, which basically keeps it from collapsing. Well, they found more platforms at 30 feet, at 40 feet, at 50 feet, at 60 feet, at 70 feet, at 80 feet, and at 90 feet. But at 90 feet, there was a stone on top of the platform various descriptions of the stone from people who actually saw it. I mean, it, and they're, they're similar, but not a lot, exactly alike. But the, when they turned it over, they saw that there were either letters and symbols or just symbols. So there's been some disagreement that had been carved into the thing. So they took it out of the, uh, out of the pit, but then the pit began to slowly fill with water, get a little bit muddy. So they, it was at the end of the day, so they decided to you know, come back the next day and deal with digging in mud, they thought. But when they came back, it was filled to it, it was filled with water to 65 feet. And they had tripped some kind of a flood system that would defeat and has defeated uh, treasure hunters for, you know, two centuries. But um, so ultimately they couldn't solve that. Another expedition came in the mid-1800s early mid 1800s and they all they, they were defeated by the flood system but they decided to go when they were trying to figure out what it was that was causing the flooding they went down to Smith's Cove which is nearby and discovered this fantastic man-made beach I mean an amount of work is hard to imagine but it's it, you know someone had dug up the entire beach all the sand and created this mat of uh, uh, coconut husks and and uh, seaweed it form a sort of sponge, and under that there were all these really well-made rock drains. So, you know, who who could who could or would do that? Because it would have been literally thousands of man hours to do it. It's a whole stretch of beach, and to do the money pit obviously would have been tens of thousands of man hours too. So, you know, 
that's what's held the fascination of people ever since, is that somebody went to this extraordinary length, some group of people, and did this fantastic work, so there had to be a fantastic reason. And, you know, the clues have continued to pile up ever since. You know, one expedition after another has brought it. They've all discovered, nearly all discovered something that's, that's you know, equally amazing to what preceded it. But they they they've pointed in different directions for different people, which has led to all the debate and, and the profusion of theories about what it is. We're talking with Randall Sullivan. He's written a book called The Curse of Oak Island, and we're going to continue uh, chatting with him after our break here. A lot more to come. You listen to Jason and JV, Beyond Reality Radio. We'll be back after this. Hey, gang, JV here. You know that great nutrition can lead to a great life. Healthy, happy, rewarding. But that nutrition simply cannot be found in the foods we eat alone. Take a minute and assess your health, the way you feel, the way your family feels, the way your kids feel. Health is more than just feeling well. It's also making sure you have a strong immune system, especially in these trying times. Vitamins aren't enough alone. In fact, they have to be the right vitamins, the right supplements made from the most effective ingredients. Otherwise, they don't do the job. It makes the world of a difference. There's a new website you can visit that'll help you navigate these ideas and guide you to better health. There's no obligation. Just visit MyHealthRocksNow.com. That's MyHealthRocksNow.com and start feeling better today. Welcome back to Beyond Reality Radio with Jason and JV. We're talking with Randall Sullivan about his new book called The Curse of Oak Island. And Randall, this is kind of a short segment, but uh, when we talk about how this story started, at least how the searcher part of the story started, um, you talked about the teenage boys that found the circular depression on the island, which ultimately became the money pit. You kind of referenced, but uh, in a way that I th- seems to be more and more common these days, the original story I heard there was a they saw a light on the island and went to investigate. That's when they f- saw the pit, and they found block and tackle in a tree above the pit. That's why they thought it, there was something there. But these parts of the story seem to be have have been disproven at this point, or at least are uh, in question. Yeah, I mean, I'd say that those are that's more apocrypha than fact. I mean, it, the, the stories that were you know, this came from either the young men themselves or their families, the earliest accounts, uh, back the, the earliest account was that they initially saw that there had been a bunch of old oak trees cut down and there were new oak trees growing, and they hadn't seen that before, and then they noticed that it was within a, a circular depression. But all of the stories do agree that there was an old wooden tackle block uh, hanging from uh, one of the limbs of one of the surviving big trees, and when they tried to remove it, it fell and crumpled into pieces because it was so old. So I thought that was apocryphal when I first heard it, but since it was repeated in all the stories, uh, all of the account, early accounts, I think it must be true. So in the timeline, when this first group of searchers uh, came up to the point where it was just beyond their means to solve the riddle of the flooding uh, tunnels, uh, what happens next in terms of, you know, there was no there was no social media to start talking about a, a buried treasure maybe on this island. Uh, so how was how was this story propagated at that point? Well, the discovery of the artificial beach was what really sort of spread it throughout uh, you know, the East Coast and into the United States. But you know, so it was basically confined confined to Nova Scotia before that. But um, you know, but, but the money pit itself. I mean, that you know, people actually saw that with their own eyes. Saw the stones. Saw that something had incredibly been done. So it was simply word of mouth in those days. But there were no published accounts of what had happened until you know, a half a century after the money pit's discovery. Since those, they were just teenagers. The three, two of the three of them, were still alive to give some, you know, to give their accounts. Um, but uh, you know. But all those early accounts, you kind of, I, I, I came to just kind of accept what was repeated rather than because there were enough small differences. They weren't major, actually. They, they were, they were fairly consistent, but there were, all, there were some small differences in the various accounts, and some people have tried to use those to say, oh, it's all made up. But honestly, the naysayers and the debunkers, they cherry pick the facts way more than, <laughs> than the most fantastic theorists do. So. I mean, I don't, I don't put a lot of stock in them. 
Well, and of course, you look at it and you think the things that are being talked about being done, the holes being dug the way they were, the the box uh, drain systems that were set up for a booby trap, these are things that are extremely complicated even today. And you think yeah. about them them doing this that long ago. Yeah, I mean, they didn't have the technology then. So and that's part of the problem is that, you know, this, that what they attempted over and over, and it, it's like you're repeating the same mistake, but they couldn't think of another way, was to try to dig a, another nearby pit, tunnel to it, and drain the water that way. But that just led to one collapse. And, and, you know, near death and ultimately death uh, for some of the searchers. But uh, it also just made a total mess of that whole money pit area, because which the money pit itself collapsed with 10,000 board feet of cribbing uh, in 1861. And so it is just it's just a jumble of holes and tunnels and you know, old boards that fell down, you know, and, and debris left by searchers. So it's made it much more complicated. Now, in some of the uh, the things you also see where they're talking about uh, in the past using drill bits, uh, drilling down, and actually pulling the drill bits out and having fragments of gold on that? Um, well, there was whether it was gold or not, I'm not sure. There, there was uh, uh, small links of a chain which were not described as gold in the very first account. Just They were just described as, as small links of a chain, of, uh, like a jewelry chain or a watch chain, something like that. It became gold over time, so I'm not sure it was. But I mean, really, the probably sending a drill down to bring something up. The the most startling discovery to a lot of people was the drill that brought up a, a just a tiny scrap of parchment paper right. with writing on it with a quill pen, and, and uh, uh, that was what started to convince people thinking that there was something besides a treasure of gold or silver or something that there was a historical. Treasure. We're having a great time tonight talking about the mystery of Oak Island, a small island off the coast of Nova Scotia. It's a, a kind of a dot in uh, right off the coast. It's a bunch of islands out there that kind of make up uh, this area. And this one has something pretty unique on it. And first of all, if nothing else, it's a history of mystery. And uh, it could be as much as a, a major a uh, treasure that has disappeared over the course of time that is waiting to be found. And things like the Ark of the Covenant or um, uh, Marie Antoinette's lost jewels, things that history has been Captain looking Kid's for, treasure. has been looking for for a long time. And it could be anything. And that's what makes this story so unbelievable. And we've really waited for this. We've been excited about about this show for quite a while because JV and I have both been big fans of the Curse of Oak Island TV show, let alone the history and, and just the stories behind it. And we've got the guy who's just written so much about it throughout, throughout the past and just an, a great writer uh, joining us tonight, Randall Sullivan. And thank you so much for hanging out with us, Randall. Thanks for having me, you guys. So, Randall, as you... You're, as I learned tonight, you're the guy that kind of opened this door, got this story uh, something to be talked about again, got the blood flowing again in this story. Um, and the Lagina brothers came in at what point and started their, uh, maybe not necessarily the work they're doing today, but at least started to get the ball rolling toward what we're watching on television these days. Well, I, the Laginas made a trip to Oak Island not long after that Rolling Stone article was published, but uh, they've sort of got the bums rush from uh, Dan Blankenship. He let them on the island, um, and Rick kind of endeared himself by, you know, pitching in to do some work. Uh, uh, Dan was like cutting brush or something, but Dan didn't spend much time with them. Sort of took off, and so they made this, you know. 2000 mile drive to, to get to get there and probably got you know to be on the island for less than 10 minutes but it just how compelled Rick in particular was by this uh, is evident in in 2007 they saw an ad in a fairly obscure magazine well it's a magazine read by rich people actually but uh, that uh, about real estate uh, and uh, Dan Blankenship's partner was trying to sell just one plot, one lot on Oak Island, but the Laguna saw that as their way in, and so they made that purchase, and you know everything unfolded from there. They got, they eventually bought uh, his share and owned fifty percent of fifty percent of about seventy percent of Oak Island. And do they uh, these real estate holdings? Do they own a good chunk of the real estate now? They do. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, Mario Lagina had owned a very successful energy company, which he sold right around that time. And for, you know, I can't remember the exact year, but it was around $100 million. Um, so he was loaded and had the, had the, the wherewithal. And he was, you know, he'd always been so impressed by his brother's fascination with the story and realized that this, you know, the, 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 just the real estate would have some value. And it was a chance to really do something interesting and do something with his brother. So he went for it and, and invested. I mean, it, it was not cheap to buy the land they purchased at that point because Tobias was selling to that he had people very anxious to get it, get in. Well, and I, I love on the show that it shows how close those brothers truly are and how much respect they have for one another. And uh, and it just goes to show you've, you've got Rick and Marty. And Marty is always so supportive of of Rick's beliefs and, and his thoughts. And, and just to see him working together, is, it's just a great thing to see. Yeah, I mean, that's been a lot of what has made it such a popular show. The, 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 the relationship of these two brothers who are very different. I mean, one is basically a man of science and sort of a skeptic, and the other's, you know, a romantic a man of faith, really. Uh, that'd be Rick. And uh, uh, so, but they somehow mesh. And, and uh, uh, even though they do have, you know, some pretty heated disputes off camera, there still is a lot of, of, of deep love and affection between the two of them. It's always there. And you're one of the few people that have spent time with them because they seem awfully reluctant to take a public spotlight outside of the show. Um, how how did the the show concept come get off the ground? And was it something that the Lagina brothers were looking at when they made their first uh, efforts to purchase and get involved with Oak Island? Or that come, did it come later? No, absolutely not. They didn't want it. They they had never even occurred to them to do a show, and they were very resistant to it at the beginning. And I know that from Kevin Burns, who really is the creator of the show, the executive producer who owns the production company that makes the show, um, you know, he had to talk them into it, and uh, and, it, and it wasn't that easy. But you know, they they saw the advantages of all he could offer, which was to bring you know some of the leading experts in various sciences to the island, and and the additional financing that they would get, and so, but. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't, I really believe Rick sincerely doesn't really care that much about being a, quote, TV star. I think Marty enjoys it, but it wasn't what motivated him. And they both, I know for a fact, they both told the producers that if they, if they, if they ever caught the producers doing anything that was staged or faked, the show would end immediately. Well, I think that's important, uh, especially when it comes down to reality television. I've been involved in reality reality television for 15 years, and that's one of the main things is you always want to make sure that what you're doing is coming off as honest and sincere and, and real. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and it does come naturally to those two guys. I mean, I, I even though you know I may have had some disagreements with them about specific stuff, I mean, their sincerity and their determination to be faithful custodians of this this historic treasure hunt has always been you know, really admirable in my head. Well, and we've talked about it numerous times on the show where it it would appear that, you know, them doing the television show is uh, is mainly and ma- mainly because it's financially beneficial to help them offset the costs of all the work that they're doing on that island. I can't imagine imagine the cost of that what's going into a lot of the things they're doing. So having the production company there and the network there, of course, is going to offset their costs on on all this uh, this big work. Yeah, the specifics of that are something nobody ever wants to talk about, even to me. But, um, but yes, I mean, and, and how much the Laginas themselves are spending and how much the network is paying, I don't know. But I just, I do know the scale of the work has gotten more and more fantastic. When I was there in se- this past September and saw what they'd done at Smith's Cove, I mean, for, for two centuries, people have been trying to build some sort of dam that would basically hold back the ocean so that they could dig because the the sea has risen over the years so what was you know dry land on oak island back in the 1700s is now underwater and they were they successfully built a dam that held back the ocean and, and allowed them to 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 you know dig where people had stood you know hundreds of years earlier and that's the sort of thing that you know the scale of investment financial investment and uh, investment of labor 
uh, has produced. And uh, you brought that up. That was actually part of uh, a major focus of tonight's episode of The Curse of Oak Island. They built that coffer dam, which I think they've made reference to costing over a million dollars just to put that dam in place so they could start that excavation work. And that brings up this U-shaped structure, which is something that Dan Blankenship discovered in the 70s. And it was the target of Rick and Marty Lugina as they built the coffer dam and started digging on in Smith's Cove. Do we have any sense uh, of what that U-shaped structure is? And I know that some of this is speculation on your part, but can you give me an idea of what you think it is and who put it there? Well, I think it might be the remnants of what was sort of a combination dam and wharf. Uh, and that's, I, I know that's what Dan thought at the time. Uh, you know, they, they had, whatever they learned about that, they couldn't, they would not share that with me when I was on the island in September. I had to sign a confidentiality agreement anyway. Right. So I couldn't, I, I couldn't say it if I knew. But, um, but I think that they have, gotten a clear idea of wh- what that was but i what, what i what i think and what i think the, the other people looked at it is that uh, it was a way it was a way for ships to dock and and it also held back the sea and of course as the episodes continue here uh, through the winter we'll probably get more of those answers won't we I'm assuming we will. I mean, yeah. I'm certain we will, actually. Yeah. They told me that the answers would be forthcoming. They just weren't going to give them to me in September before the show started running. Did you Did you get a chance to look at the work in September? Because I imagine that oh, was being done yeah. over the summer, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, they had, they had built the coffer dam by then, and that was the first thing they wanted to show me mm-hmm. when I got there. I mean, they were all still really excited by it, and, right. I, and it was staggering at its scale. I mean, I, I, I was... I mean, what they'd done the previous year at the Money Pit, or, or in, actually in 2016 when I was there, was was impressive. But this was this was really staggering, and and, uh, and they were just so so pleased to have accomplished it, and and it was just amazing to see, you know, this ground that no one had stood on in all those years being explored, and uh, you know, they told me a little bit of what they would found, but they were being pretty cagey with it, which is understandable. <laughs> I mean, they you know they they want somebody. Right. appeared on the show. Randall, one of the uh, probably the biggest challenges the Laginas have had to face, uh, more so than any of the other uh, treasure hunters before them, just because these things are cum- cumulative, and you referenced it in, earlier in our discussion, is that the landscape of this island has changed so much due to those efforts to find this treasure. When they talk about the money pit, the, the fact is they don't really know exactly where that is, do they? No, they don't. They're guessing based on you know, previously published tracks and, you know, old maps and things like that. I mean, I think they're very close to, to, to where it is. They probably certainly caught part of it in their excavations, but, you know, they have, the, the, they bring up very old wood, but that very old wood could be from 1800 from the, uh, the treasure hunters, um, you know, back then. Uh, so, you know, and carbon dating can tell you, you know, something about how old, an artifact is, but it's not a very exact science. It's usually a, a you know, it gives you a window of maybe two hundred years. So, uh, yeah, it's been it's been a that that part has been a very tough struggle, and uh, and and it, it it's such a jumble down there that you know it, it's an it, it was an engineering challenge in the first place of extraordinary dimensions, but it's 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 been amplified exponentially by all the previous efforts. How is it, and this is one of the things that makes it so difficult to fathom what's going on here, how is it that uh, a group of people um, several hundred years ago could use uh, their engineering technology to create something that baffles us today with the technology we have to put against it? Well, that is, to me, a central question and one that, you know, has influenced what I've you know been interested in in terms of potential theories. When I was on the island back in 2003, Dan Blankenship said to me at one point, "Well, whoever designed this was the smartest SOB in the history of the human race." And so I started thinking in terms of, of who, well, who was the smartest SOB in the history of the human race, and that you know inclined me to, to be interested in some theories I thought were ridiculous at first. Uh, I don't want to get into theories yet because we're going to have to go to break before we can get through them all, but we will on the other side of the break. But um, 
As you look back at the uh, evidence that has been brought to surface from one searcher or another, what bits of evidence impress you the most? Well, I mean, some of the recent stuff has been that the Laginas have found. Yeah, I mean, the early discoveries, obviously, those, those from the first few expeditions into the middle of the of the uh, 19th century. But what the Laginas have found just in the past, the previous summer, the, the human remains down at 180 feet, the skeletons, and uh, uh, the cross, you know, from that's been dated to the 13th century that... I mean, I, I've never been very supportive of the whole Knights Templar theory. I've been pretty skeptical about it, and I, I am fairly skeptical in the book about it. But at the same time, you know, when Rick showed me that this cross they they found on the island from the 13th century matched exactly this drawing on the wall where the Knights Templar were held in the 13th century at Dom Prison, uh, it, I thought, well... That, I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to dismiss it outright. That's for sure. That is an amazing. Uh, I don't even. I don't know what to call it. I was going to say coincidence, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a coincidence. But that's an amazing piece of evidence to see that cross and then see that etching on the prison wall in France. It's identical. It, it is. It is like one was made from the other. It, it does look that way. I mean, I have to say, and I mean, I know how I. I know from talking to Rick how impressed he was by it. And, uh, and you know, everybody loves the Templar theory. I love it. It's the most, of all of the theories out there, it's the most exciting one. I mean, that the Ark of the Covenant or the Holy Grail could be what's buried on Oak Island. I mean, what could be better than that? Uh, but as a story, I just, there are a lot of things about how that, you know, there are a lot of problems for me with, the, with that theory. But, again, that's one of the... <laughs> fascinating and problematic things about Oak Island is that it's really hard to rule out any theory. I, it's, I, I, the most satisfying thing to me was to find a theory that I could actually say, no, that's not it. <laughs> because, <laughs> and, but there's so few you can do that with. Well, and I know throughout the time, there's been like 40 different pits dug as well throughout the island. And it, it just makes you wonder if they do find anything, if well, if it's if it's actually going to be salvageable, if it's going to be destroyed, and and that's that's another scary thing when it comes down to it. Yeah, and there's always been the question of, well, okay, something fantastic was buried there, but the people might have come back, probably did come back and retrieve it long ago. Yeah. The, the the main retort to that has been the, the condition of the money pit when those boys found it, because why would you seal it all back up so neatly, you know, with all the... the and, and it's clear that those platforms were about preventing compaction of the of the soil to keep it the depression from being really obvious. Mm -hmm. So why would someone go to all that trouble? Yeah. Uh, if, well, if they'd actually come back and take them whatever was buried down there. Well that's a great point. And we'll get into a lot more of that. We're gonna take a quick break, a lot more to come. You listen to Jason and J V Beyond Reality Radio. We'll be back after this. Please support the program. Go to patreon.com slash Joha. That's J O H A W. The Curse of Oak Island is a hit TV show on the History Channel. Uh, it's the story of the Lagina brothers and their effort to uncover what is uh, pur purported to be buried treasure on Oak Island off the coast of Nova, Nova Scotia. Our guest tonight is an expert on the topic. Uh, Randall Sullivan has written the book called The Curse of Oak Island. Now, Randall, would, is it fair to say that the book is kind of a companion to the TV show? Does it follow it closely in addition to telling the story of Oak Island? Well, it would be hard for me to deny that. I, 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 the book happened as a result of uh, Kevin Burns, who produces the show, asking me to join the cast, although they don't like to call it a cast, uh, of the show for uh, in the summer of 2016. And, you know, he, he, he wanted it to be, well, you wrote the famous Rolling Stone article, and now you're coming back to research a book. And I told my publisher, and my publisher said, well, then you better write a book. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, how, that's how that happened. And then after the book was written... Um, without getting into a lot of details, the a &E, which owns the History Channel, compelled me to make it the, the official book of the show. Uh, but Kevin Burns made that actually not a very painful, not nearly as painful as I thought it would be. Um, so that's how that happened. So we've talked about the Knights Templar, and uh, that's one of the many, many possibilities of uh, groups or or people that may have placed whatever it is that's there, there. Uh, what are some of the other more credible ideas that have been discussed that you would look at and say, yeah, this, this has some plausibility? 
Well, there, there are some treasure theories. I mean, gold and silver. I've, I've always kind of resisted that it could be gold or silver because I just can't imagine getting people to do that kind of work. You know, the people would do that just just for something of monetary value. But as Dan Blankenship says, well, they didn't do it. They had slaves do it. So there are, there, there are uh, you know, there's a lot of historical evidence that would support the idea that it's the treasure of Havana, which was seized by the British Navy uh, or or. Inc, you know, gold that was taken from the Incans and uh, Incas and and uh, uh, you know you know Spanish conquistadors that didn't want to return it to the mother country hid it there. I mean, there, and and a few other things like that. Uh, as I said, the Knights Templar story is very popular, and even though there's a, I have a lot of problems with it, there's certainly pieces of evidence that you can't deny. A theory that I really dismissed when I first heard it, but came to to really see is increasingly plausible because I mean it's it sounded so ridiculous to me at first, but was is that the followers of Francis Bacon, who was a genius of Elizabethan England, um, did this to sort of secure his work. Some people think it's because he wrote the Shakespeare plays, and you know that's what's hidden there. I don't go along with that, but but uh, but he was an extraordinarily brilliant man who had a. A, a vast following of the finest minds in, of, of that time, uh, and uh, great men themselves who looked to him as the greatest among them, and people who clearly wanted to, in some way, carry on his work. So, I mean, I could go into the details, but but uh, there, there is there's enough there there to make me think that uh, that has to be taken seriously. Let's jump to our listener line. Uh, this is Joe in Indiana with a question. Hey, Joe, you're on with Randall Sullivan. Hey, Randall. Hey, guys. How are you all doing? Good. Welcome to the show, man. Hey, um, I was wondering, maybe, I don't know if the theory would be that um, since they're not finding anything big right now, that this could be a place where they put it to hide it from someplace else that they might actually put the treasure. You know what I'm saying? That they're saying... Yeah. That's out I mean, there. Could you be, understand could what I mean? Moved to somewhere else? Is that what you're? Yeah, I mean, could it be somewhere else? And this could be just a hoax for them. To you mean like this is a de- this is a decoy? Like uh, this is yeah, a like phony a decoy. And what do you think yeah, about well, that? I mean, right? the, actually, I mean, there are people who've proposed that idea. There's a whole theory that you know it was done by. Um, but there's actually two different theories that it was done by people working for the Americans during the Revolutionary War and, and or that it was done by the Royalists during the Revolutionary War. And, um, and, and there's some other things, too, that, uh, other theories that, that are sort of like that, but, but they're, you know, they're entirely speculative. There isn't anything, you know, to hold on to other than, well, I guess that's possible. <laughs> but there's nothing, yeah. you know, there's nothing solid there. And that's kind of the whole, uh, the whole problem with th- this whole search all the way around is that there's it not, everything points somewhere, but it doesn't point to anything. Joe, thank you for the question. That's a great insight. Um, I wanted to ask you about the 90 foot stone, uh, Randall, and this episode, last episode of the show, and they followed up more on tonight's episode. Uh, they found a block stone. Uh, I don't remember the name of the store in, um, it was in, I think in Halifax, uh, that the last reported sighting of the 90 foot stone was, uh, and they suspect this might be that stone. Do you have any opinion either way? Well, it's, it's a book binding business in Halifax. that was the last place that the stone was seen. It was in the window of the, of this book binding business as sort of an advertisement, I guess, back in the late 19th century. Um, whether it, you know, that was actually the stone or whether, you know, the, it was the stone for a while and it got subbed out or something. I mean, there's just, the short answer to that is I don't know. Because one of the people who would probably, the, who left the best record of what happened to the stone, and he doesn't know, he didn't know either, was that they treated it with such disrespect that they used it basically to pound leather hides uh, that they used for, to, you know, for the covers of books and basically wore away the because it was really just sort of scr- a scratching more than a deep carving, and basically wore away the inscription. And I think that's that could have been what happened, and and maybe that's recoverable. I don't know, but uh, but no one has no one has any idea what happened to the stone from there. So the the idea that it could be somewhere in the building that's the obvious starting point. And and Kevin and the Latinas, Kevin Burns is the producer of the show, and the Latinas told me in September that you know they thought they might have found it. And 
uh, hinted that it was there. So well, I guess now, short answer is, uh, you know, it's possible. Now, also, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt uh, was actually there looking into the money pit as well, correct? Long yeah, before he was actually, he was there digging, working for a summer, and re- and remained completely fascinated by Oak Island. Even when he was had been reelected president of the United States, he was corresponding with the people who were running the treasure hunt on Oak Island, trying to keep up with what was going on. And that was mainly and because got, uh, t- tales had been passed down through his family, correct? They had been. I mean, the, their theory in the family is one of the few that I think can be dismissed, and that's the theory that it was the French crown jewels. Because, and the reason I say that is because the French crown jewels have all been accounted for. There was only one, the most fantastic one, that has never been actually found. But I think scientists at the Smithsonian made a good case that the Hope Diamond, which is a very famous diamond, was actually cut from that, the French blue, which was the, the that, that particular stone that was missing. But all of the other diamonds and, and gems that were the, the French crown jewels have been accounted for. So that's not what's buried there. Going back to the 90-foot stone, um, and I'm a little unclear on this, and I've watched the episodes, uh, but the reports from the last person to have seen it prior to its recent, maybe, discovery say that the initials LN were on it. Is is that an accurate report from that individual? Because clearly LN are on this stone that they found. Well... I was told the word someone had carved initials into the stone, but it wasn't the initials LN. And, um, you know, I'd heard this from a, you know, a fairly, fairly authoritative source that I, I can't identify because it, it's so complicated. It's all wrapped up in this Freemasonry that is very big in Canada. But um, um, so it, it was news to me that the, that the initials were LN because I thought they were uh a different different initials belong to a different person. So, uh, and I just don't know what to make of that. So there's a little bit of uh, uncertainty with that. There is, in yeah. my mind, because yeah. I, I really thought that if you know that's if they did identify the stones, because they would find the these other initials, uh, and that's not them. So, how many times have you appeared on the show? At least a couple, right? Um, I was on like I think four or five episodes back in uh, uh, 2016, and um, and then I, I I think I don't know if I, I, I all, as far as I know I've just been on one episode so far this season. I think I'm going to be on one more, but I did. Uh, they have a, 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 a sort of a side special called Drilling Down, and I think I did. Like they said, I was going to be in like three of those. So I don't know. I mean, I I I, I don't. I, I, I don't enjoy watching myself on television, so I don't. I don't actually look at it very often. I used to have my own television show, and so that that kind of jaded me on the whole thing. Do you enjoy uh, the work that goes into what we see on the television show? Oh, for sure. I mean, I mean, as I said before, you know, Rick and Marty are totally earnest about what they're doing, and and you know, there's no. I mean, I used to, when I used to have a show, I used to joke about the unreality of reality television, but. Um, but Rick and Marty really have done their their best to keep it real on that show, and 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 really it, it's it's a it's kind of a moving thing to see that all the people, even the crew members who are working on the show, are into it. I mean, they 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 all are speculating and and you know caught up in the in the you know, the fever of the search, and and so you know what you're seeing in that show, in this particular show, it really is you know. So when it comes down to the, the whole thing with this coconut fibers, and I uh, I know coconut fibers, they can use them for many different things, whether it's a filtration system to allow uh, to keep dirt and debris out and just allow water to pass through and everything else. I know that there's some controversy in that because, uh, you know, three uh, well, 300 years ago or whatever, um, you're looking at, well, coconuts are nowhere near that area in the vicinity, right? The closest they are is, what, Bermuda? Um, yeah, you'd have to go practically to the equator below but about a thousand um, miles yeah but they were they were commonly used as dunnage on ships of that era though in the in the in the 17th 16th and 17th centuries so there was a lot of coconut fiber being hauled around the the atlantic ocean uh in the, because both spanish and english ships used it um, and copious amounts of it so it's not inconceivable that you know, various ships had it aboard because well, they did have it aboard. It, it was it was the main 
anything that was, that, that was used for dunnage on those ships. So obviously, obviously there's an incentive by uh, the producers of the Curse of Oak Island television show to not get an answer, because once they have an answer, I guess the show ends. Is, is there anything that we have to fear that they might uh, keep answers from us just to extend the TV show? Well, I mean, I, I, I won't deny that that thought and suspicion has, has crossed my mind. Um, but again... You know, Rick and Marty really do run it. You know, as, as I saw when I was there in September, because the producers and the network were kind of anxious about letting me explore on my own, and I was there with my then fiance now wife, and um, and Rick and Marty said, "No, no, they we're going to give him a golf cart, and he can go anywhere he wants on the island. He could take his girlfriend with him." And and uh, and and you know, the producers and the network bowed to them. So they are the they run the show, and and uh, I, neither of them would ever you know, bury the truth or conceal it. I mean, they're just not that kind of people. Well, I don't think he's, I don't think he means bury or, or conceal it, but I mean, I mean draw, draw it with, out, of course, as long as possible. Well, I mean, I think the producers in the network would love to do that, obviously. <laughs> it's in their interest to do it, but, but I don't think Rick and Marty would go along with it, uh, is what I'm saying. Well, like I said, if they if they found it this year, we won't know until the last episode. <laughs> the very final <laughs> season very, closer well, will be the one. <laughs> um, well, they always they always save the big find for the last episode. Yeah. That's been the pattern. Yeah. yeah. Well, that makes sense from a from a, a TV production standpoint, I suppose. Um, Randall, where can people get a hold of this book? And you've got other books too, right? Well, I have quite a few. Yeah, you do. Books. <laughs> yeah, was, I knew the one, answer. One of them was, just, was just recently made into a film starring Johnny Depp. I hope everyone will see that when it's released in the spring. But um, uh, but it's available in bookstores everywhere and and on Amazon. I'd rather people go to Barnes and Noble than yeah. buy it on Amazon. But I'm grateful for people who buy it anyway. Yeah. And when and you talk about the one with Johnny Depp. Is that the Labyrinth? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm actually in, in Forrest Whitaker's in that as well. Correct. He is as well. He plays the character who was called Randall Sullivan in the first four drafts of the screenplay. All right. Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to that. That's one. cool. And um, you know, I, that paradox that we all kind of face in today's world of commerce, where Amazon sells it all, but we really hope that people do support uh, some of the other retailers in addition to Amazon. Um, I get that as well. It's it's kind of a tough spot for all of us to be in. Yeah, it is. But I mean, on the other hand. I'm, I'm happy Absolutely. You know, that the books are being sold anywhere. Right? Absolutely true. So what's next on your plate? Um, well, I, I, do, I have a follow-up to Labyrinth coming out in um, June. Well, when the, 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 after, the, the date of the movie's release is firmly set, and, and so since this is tied to the movie, it's a follow-up to the book the movie's based on. It will be released when the movie comes out, probably in May or June. And that's pretty uh, much and, a detective. And, uh, it's, it's, it's called Dead Wrong. Okay, and, but Labyrinth is the detective investigates the murders of Tupac Shakur and Notorious B.I.G., correct? Right, and, oh. and the new one, you know, it, it, it tells you what's happened in the uh, 15 years since Labyrinth was published. Well, Randall, this has been a great discussion. It's one we've looked forward to for a long time. We hope you'll come back, especially if in one of these episodes coming up, uh, the mystery is solved and we, we actually get some final and serious uh, answers with some finality. Well, that would be thrilling. <laughs> Randall, thanks so much for coming and hanging out with us tonight, and we look forward to thanks. talking to you again. Thanks, you guys. You have a great night. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll come back and wrap things up. It's Beyond Reality Radio with Jason and JV. Looking for our guest's book? Go to Amazon.com slash shop slash JVJTaps. Welcome back to Beyond Reality Radio, Jason and JV, and uh, great discussion. I really, really am fascinated by this story, and I ultimately can't wait to see how it all turns out. Either can I, man. It's, uh, it's one of those things where, honestly, it's like I felt a couple of those seasons were a little rough because it was just dragging, dragging along. And, uh, but things have kind of picked up pretty good recently. Yeah. The, and I don't know if it's because they've just, they've really ramped up the amount of investment in the search. I mean, this yeah, whole coffer dam in Smith's Code, you, I don't know if you remember, was it last season or the season before that where they, they put the inflatable yeah. dam around. You know, yeah. I was like, uh, it was a horrible, horrible <laughs> mistake. And they really didn't. Nothing came from that. Um, so uh, the fact that they're putting more money into the into the effort and they're using uh, uh, newer and more sophisticated technology uh, is yielding some results. And you can't have to say it really is. It really is, and just the things they're finding. And I don't know. It's it's interesting whether they find anything or not. 
I tune in every week, and the wife tunes in every week, and my kids <laughs> tune in every week to, to see. Yeah, it's become an Alex and, and, and JV uh, Tuesday night uh Ritual, I guess. Um, tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about uh, remote viewing with uh, Russell Targ. He has a documentary called Third Eye Spy. This is going to be an interesting topic. Yeah, this is going to be wild. Uh, we're going to be talking, well, we're going to be talking about found down Russian bombers, uh, weapon factories, U.S. hostages, and U.S. intelligence and intel agencies. And, well, just, you know, it, it's pretty much the third eye spy, bottom line. Yeah, That's hang, it. On, hang on. I got to fix this chair. You look like you're really, really small. Yeah, there. All of a sudden, been, you took it, all in. Talk about paranormal. This thing just keeps dropping on me. And it was fine for months, and all of a sudden, it won't stay at the height I like. I <laughs> so, hey, if you haven't yet, head over to Facebook.com slash Beyond Reality Radio. Like that Facebook page for us. Then head to BeyondRealityRadio.com. Find all the stations we air on. We're constantly adding new stations, so check the, uh, the list often. Also, download the free smartphone apps which allow you to listen live, catch past shows, all on the go, and more. Any night we're live, just listen right from the website. If you download the show from iTunes or anywhere else, take two seconds of your time and rate it for us because it really helps us. That's going to pretty much do it for us tonight, everybody. It's Jason and JV. We'll catch you all tomorrow. Beyond Reality Radio is hosted by Jason Hawes and J.V. Johnson and produced by Alexandria Johnson and Slick Eddie Edwards for Intercom Radio. Beyond Reality Radio is distributed by Westwood One Radio Networks. Stop by our Facebook page and say hello. Follow the hosts on Facebook as well. For Jason Hawes, follow at JasonHawes.Taps. For J.V. Johnson, follow at J.V.J. Paranormal. If you'd like to be a guest on Beyond Reality Radio or you have a suggestion for a guest, contact Slick Eddie Edwards at SlickEddieEdwards at gmail.com. Be sure to visit our chat room as well at beyondrealityradio.com. Thanks for listening.